I've had two people say, I'm not here for the coaching. I just want to work out. I'm like, down the street, there are 18 other types of gyms and they don't coach and they, you can go in and do whatever you want, but not here. The salt shaker comes back to the center. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is why I'm gonna change your life. You can give it a shot and see, but this is how we do it. And then we hold the line on that standard. Welcome to the best hour of their day podcast with your hosts, Jason Fernandez. And me, Jason Ackerman. With more than 20 years in the business, as both coaches and affiliate owners, our passion is to help create world-class affiliates and coaches by building better boxes. boxes. Welcome to the best hour of your day. We're going to talk about coaching, how to develop a world-class staff. But first of all, I want to take just a moment to thank you. To thank you for being here, to thank you for all of the hard work that I personally know that you've been doing for however long you've been doing it. it makes me emotional. It's an amazing movement. We are changing, we have changed the face of fitness, what people think about as fitness across the world. And we are changing the face of health and what people see and have, see that they're capable of controlling. It's in their control. Their health is a marker. The fitness is a marker of their health. And you as affiliate owners, the passion that you have to go out into the world and change lives on a daily basis is incredible. And I know that that passion exists. This is not easy. I have been in those trenches for 16 years. I have owned an affiliate since 2006. I have been on seminar staff since 2006. I started CrossFit in 2004. I had an incredible privilege of starting CrossFit when there were four affiliates in the world. And it came straight from Coach Glassman. I had no interpreter. I got to hear exactly what I needed to hear. He gave the tools to those of us who were able to be there from the early days. And it is my, my dying wish and hope that I can keep passing that forward and to continue to hold the ethos and hold the culture and hold the CrossFit kernel in its place so that it doesn't get diluted. And it isn't anyone's fault that there might be some dilution. It's just that we've gotten, you know, it's just further and further from Coach Glassman. And it's up to us to continue to hold that. Adrian Bosman, in one of our staff summits a few years ago, talked about the salt shaker at the middle of the table. And maybe some of you guys have heard this analogy elsewhere as well, but we have our table. In my house, the salt shaker's in the middle. That's where Greg Glassman put it. He taught me what CrossFit was what his intentions were for it. That salt shaker, somebody else comes to our table and they shift it to the right. And they're like, you know what, I kind of like it over here. And if we let it stay there, and then another person comes in and they shift it a little to the left, and pretty soon it's in a completely different place. No, I'm moving it back to the center. And that's what we are doing today. That is what we are doing with every one of these affiliate gatherings. We're moving that salt shaker back and it's no fault if it got shifted. It just needs us to put it back there to understand where it belongs. Thank you for wanting to learn that if you didn't already. Thank you for wanting to reset it if it got shifted and your, your, your eye was off the ball for a little bit. All of us have gone there and it's okay. What I want you guys to understand is that there is no judgment about what's happening and what's not happening in your affiliates. It's like looking at an athlete through the 10 general physical skills. Let's find your areas 
of weakness and develop those. Let's bring you up across the board of all of those adaptations. When you're evaluated as a coach through the six training criteria, there's no judgment. It is just find the spaces that you need to improve upon, and that's what we're here for. You went to the level one, and then you went later down the road to the level two, and maybe you took the level three, and you're just waiting for the level four. What's in between those spaces? for a long time, and it's on us, it's been a blank canvas. And it was up to you guys to just go out and hope that you were doing it and reflecting what you learned and the standard that was given to you. But hopefully you can see that we're really trying to offer more tools for evaluation and for development. In order to hire and to develop staff, you have to start a long time before the hiring process. You have to start with your foundation. You have to start with a mission and a vision as the owner, because without it, they're just fish floundering in the sea. They're trying to interpret what you want from them. And their interpretation may not be something that you're happy with. And so we have to start long before that. You guys have the affiliate playbook. How many of you guys have read that? Was it helpful? It's a pretty amazing thing. Do you know who put that together? Do you know where those words came from? A lot of affiliates who've been in the game for a really long time and made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> we keep on opening affiliates through the ages and we, we do it out of our passion where did you guys come from? Were you a member? Did somebody say, hey, you should open a gym, but you didn't really have a foundation, a mission, a vision, and you just kind of went into it because you loved it? And then all of a sudden you're like, well, my coaches don't do what I want them to do. I'm so frustrated with them. Well, that's because they don't understand your vision if you had one. And if you don't, it's okay. You're gonna start. You need to go back and create that. The foundation of CrossFit has some components. There's the kernel. There's our ethos. We also have leadership. And then we have coach development. Understanding these, I'm gonna define them, I'm gonna go through them, but we have to have that as the base of this pyramid, of this foundation that we're gonna build on top of our mission and vision. Who we are today, where we wanna go, who we want to be down the road, are we chasing that? If you know, if you have a mission statement, if you have a vision that you've established, you know who you are, who you wanna be, and you know where you wanna go, you have a path, and it makes a lot of decision making a lot easier. Does it match the goal? If it doesn't, you don't have to do it. Does it match the base? Because from there, you're gonna build a culture When we culture something in a biology lab, we create an optimal environment for things to grow. That's the same thing in your gyms. What kind of culture do you want to create? What kind of growth are you promoting? And does it look like CrossFit? From there, you're gonna then develop your coaches because they are the stewards of your vision. They are going to go out into your gym and they're going to touch many lives on a daily basis. Are they doing that? Are they carrying forward your vision? Do they know what it is? Did you hire people that matched your vision? I know that I hired in my path, in the history of my gym, I have. 
But I've also had times when I got desperate and I was like, I love you. You're an amazing person. You're one of my members. Would you like to go to level one next weekend? And oh, good job, you passed the test. You're now my five and 6 a.m. coach. That's how it works. And then they're like, uh, this is a PVC and this is a squat. <laughs> we are not always setting them up for success. And it's easy to point fingers at our staff and be frustrated with them, but always remember how many fingers are pointing back at you when we point one forward. It's on us to correct that. And so we need to professionalize it a little bit. We need to give them the tools and we need to make sure. And it's no judgment if they don't match the ethos or the culture or the belief. It's okay, it just, it's just, we just need to choose somebody else or give that person the tools that they need so that we can affect our members. We can ensure safety efficacy and efficiency that drives their goals, that helps them meet their goals from a health perspective as well as a performance perspective. But it all starts here. Let's talk about what those four things are that are part of our foundation, define those, and um, I want you guys to help me with some of this. The kernel. Have you guys ever um, heard that term, K-E-R-N-E-L? Yeah? How many of you guys have ever heard of it? Where from? Where, you've never, okay. Anyone else have you heard of it besides Bobby? <laughs> no, okay, good. So it does come from, not from CrossFit, which most things aren't from, are in CrossFit aren't from CrossFit. We beg, borrow, and steal all the time. But the kernel of CrossFit, In the, science, in the computer science world, the kernel is the core beginning of the operating system. It's what everything is based off of. It interprets the directions so that the computer knows what to do. It provides a platform for software to be created off of it. CrossFit is the kernel, the CrossFit methodology. The CrossFit kernel answers who we are, what we do. It answers why we do it. It also answers how we get it done. What are we? What is CrossFit? You tell me. What is CrossFit? CrossFit very functional and high intensity. Thank you for that. <laughs> Constantly varied. Oh. Functional movement at high intensity. high intensity. Has anyone ever heard that <laughs> phrase ever? I would hope so. Do your trainers know it? Could they explain it, those three pillars of our program? It's okay if they can't. But if they can't, it's something to think about. Plus, our nutrition guidelines up here. Eat meats and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. Keep intake to levels that support exercise, but not body fat. That's our nutritional protocol. What is CrossFit? With that, then gives us the why. Why do we do it? What's the goal of CrossFit? Can you tell me, besides Andy, besides Bobby, besides Fern? Tell me why we do it. A hedge against decrepitude. Hedge against decrepitude. Providing a lifeboat in the sea of chronic disease. What else? What was it? Essential 
to staying independent, quality of life, decreasing risk of injury. What is all of that? Give me one word that encompasses all of what you just said. Fitness. Fitness is a marker of health. Define it for me. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to take the test. What are we doing? We're increasing work capacity across broad time and modal domains. How long? Across the years of your life, forever and ever, amen. Lifespan. <laughs> For life. How do we do it? That's what we do. How? How do we express the practical application of that? What? What do you do in your work? In your uh, what do you do in your gyms every day? Coaching. Thank you for sure. What are you coaching? <laughs> yes. What well, about a workout? W O D. Workout of the day. But workout of the day. Doing exercise with. What you say? Didn't you say it? Coaching. coaching. With coaching. This is how we stand apart with coaching. Well, what does that mean? What are some elements? This takes precedence. This is number one to any of the other things in the ways that we express the how. What are some other things that express the how that are secondary to coaching in the workouts? teaching, seeing, and correcting. That's part of the coaching process. What about programming? The programming itself needs to be effective. And effective means that we are increasing work capacity across broad time and modal domains. It means that we know that we're doing that. So what kind of programming are you putting out? Is it driving numbers? Do your coaches have enough time to coach? Something to think about. We get your coaches in our level twos every weekend. Do you know what their biggest frustration is? The programming. They don't have time. They're frustrated. Do you know what they ask us every weekend? But when I go home, my gym owner isn't going to let me do whatever. I don't have time. How am I going to do this? And we're trying to figure out how to answer that question without sending them home saying, you got to change your ways, owner. And so we're trying to reconcile that. Who pushed the salt shaker off the center of the table about programming? Members. What, what do they ask for? More. There's one word. <laughs> We're not going to get into names. <laughs> they just say, I want more. Why do they say that? Why do they want more? They think it's better, but it's because they're not getting coached enough. I guarantee you, if someone's getting coached, they're not going to go, can you give me more? <laughs> if you're telling them, I want your knees to be driven out, open up your stance, lift your chest for me, arch that back, squeeze the shoulder blades back, versus down, stand. OK, back down to mid shin, stand. That's not coaching. We've got to bridge that gap. We need to give people the tools to understand how to see and correct so that we can elevate these things. Coming back to those members, yeah, they're hard. They get dissident. They want to push back. 
and they are our paying people. They are what's giving us the money to keep this business going. So how do we reconcile that? Well, there's some different, different, different strategies. The how piece, educate. When your athletes come into your gym, do you educate them from the get-go of what to expect? Athletes coming into our gym, we have a sit. And we talk about this. This is what we do. We have a lot of variance every day. And we will drive you to intensity that is relative to your individual capacity and capability. I will find what that is through warm-ups. I will use scaling. I will find threshold training for what's right for you. But all of your workouts, every single one of them will be coached. You will hear your name. I will have made, or the coach will have made, eye contact with you. You will be told to adjust things. I will yell at you from across the room. I am not singling you out and attacking you. I am coaching you because I love you. And I see what you need to be better for this. Do you agree to enter into this contract with me? And they have to agree. And, it, and it's okay if they don't, we just may not be the right place for them. When I have given those people the expectation of what we do, I've had two people say, I'm not here for the coaching. I just want to work out. I'm like, down the street, there are 18 other types of gyms and they don't coach, and they, you can go in and do whatever you want, but not here. The salt shaker comes back to the center. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is why I'm gonna change your life. You can give it a shot and see, but this is how we do it. And then we hold the line on that standard. The kernel is really important because it is what everything is built on top of. Earlier, I believe you had a question about the, somebody, maybe it was over here, had the difference between JP and Fern and their approach. And they could tell you that there are some differences and there's some similarities. The beauty of the kernel is that it is a platform that is very broad. It can be expressed in many places. You have it in prisons. We have it in small little warehouses across the country. It is in the military, fire departments. It's beautiful in its breadth of where it can be expressed and the applicability and how we can use it anywhere we go speaks to how, how um, I guess, how strong it is. And we can't change the kernel. What changes is the software that's laid on top of it. And that can look a lot of different ways and yet comes back to the kernel. All of the software relies on the kernel. The kernel does not rely on all of the expressions and adaptations and interpretations. Yet the degree of, what, of how authentic it is decides on whether it matches the kernel or not. But we can try all these different things and then decide, does it match the kernel? No, it does not. I've gotten too far, let's make an adjustment. And that's the beauty of it, make the change. Sometimes it's easier to understand something when we understand what it isn't versus what it is. What the kernel is not is those third-party programmings, programs, is, you know, like a lot of um, product, such as nutrition programs and food that's made and knee sleeve products and, you know, Rogue is an expression. They are part of that software creativity, but they aren't the kernel. All of those things, our community is not the kernel. Your coaches' interpretations and adaptations are not the kernel. None of that is. Our affiliate, the affiliate owner, the kernel comes down to the what, 
the why and the how. It is our North Star and it is transmitted through you and through your coaches and from our side, the level one and the level two. That's the transmission point. So thank you for being part of that and holding the line because it, and I know it's not always easy. When you're facing a business decision, it feels scary. And I will tell you firsthand, I've held that line for years with my heart and my soul. And it was not easy many times. People pushed back. There was criticisms. Another CrossFit gym started and they did it easier. And they had, you know, they dumbed it down. And so people were like, well, I just want CrossFit light. It's like, we don't do that here. <laughs> And I had to hold that line. And then I let it go a little bit for a couple of years. I hired other people to run my gym. And their interpretation took over my interpretation. My vision was no longer what ran the gym and it changed. And I couldn't put my name on that. And I got more and more and more unhappy. And I couldn't understand what was wrong with me. I was like, I'm just burned out, I guess. And it wasn't that. One of my trainers came to me one day and he sat across the table and he pushed a napkin that he'd written on across the table and it had my mission statement on it. And he's like, you need to remember this. We are changing the world one life at a time by elevating functional fitness, by changing people's self-perception, showing them what they're capable of, pushing them out into the world as better people and building community. That was my mission statement and I let that go. And that was the last day I did that. I went back and I had to sit down with a lot of trainers that were not my trainers any longer. And I was like, we're changing. We're going back. The salt shaker's coming to the middle. And I was really scared because I thought I was gonna lose a lot of clients. And I thought I was gonna lose all the trainers for sure. We had to bring it back, and it, it was really difficult, and nobody left, and everyone was grateful, and they knew it was going to be hard. There was some pushback, like, well, we, we can't have a open gym anymore. We can't do whatever we want. Nope, and it felt like being a hard ass, but at the end of the day, what are you here for? If you're here for CrossFit, this is who we are. This is what we do. This is why, and this is how we do it. Don't let go of that. And if you do, just bring it back. It's recoverable. Our ethos. Do you guys know what ethos is? Law and order. <laughs> Law and order. It's character. It's your culture. Does your gym reflect the ethos that CrossFit has built? Does it reflect this? Do your coaches know what your ethos is? If they don't, that's okay, but they can be taught. At any moment, they can be taught and realigned if they're not aligned. CrossFit was built on many things, but three things build our character. Hey guys, Nicole Christensen here with Dave Kalina, founder of O2. So I own CrossFit Roots in Boulder, Colorado, and over the years we've had a vetting process for anything that we're gonna carry in our store. And, and really our guiding principle has been I never wanted any of our members to have to say no to something every day that they walked by. Like, have to resist the urge for like, I'm carrying a paleo brownie or something like that. So there were things that we were just never gonna carry. Like we we're never gonna carry monster energy and have people say no to that every time. But O2 is definitely different. So one of the reasons is that it's it's a pure drink. It's, it's natural, it doesn't have sugar, very one gram of sugar. So Dave, talk to us a little bit about O2. I mean, that was great. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then also about the deal with Best Hour. Yeah, so, so the easiest way to think about O2 is a cleaner, healthier sports drink. Yes. And so, like Nicole said, it's only got one gram of sugar per can. 
uh, 15 calories total and no artificial ingredients. So there's nothing you can't pronounce on the side of the label. Um, everything's non-GMO approved, which we're really proud of. And it's in a can because single-use plastic sucks. And so that's O2 in a nutshell. It's also twice as efficacious as Gatorade. So we have twice the electrolytes as Gatorade, but again, only one gram of sugar. So better for you, healthier, and I know I'm biased, but I think it tastes awesome. So too. you could have electrolytes without sugar. Totally. Shocking. Totally. Shocking. Imagine that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Check it out, guys. Hard work. What does hard work mean to you? What does it evoke when I say, we do hard work? What does that say to you? If you think about your athletes, your coaches, what does it mean? One word, two words, I don't care. Anyone? Challenge? Yeah, your best effort. Meet people where they are and help them learn to do hard things and to, they'll survive it. And they'll go out into the world. That's how you're changing the world is through teaching people about hard work. Because they're gonna go out and they're gonna be like, you know what, I can do this. What did we talk about in the level one when we talked about variance? What is the purpose of variance? What does it do? It challenges us because we have to do so many things that we've never done before. It expands the margins of our experience so that when life throws us a curveball, we can reach into all that stuff we've done through CrossFit. And we can be like, you know what? This might be a new experience, but I'm going to be okay. I've done a lot of hard stuff. I've pushed my capacity to the limits. I've done things that are unfamiliar. I know how to move my body in space. I know how to move objects with my body. And emotionally, man, mental toughness, that's what we've been training our people for, is life. That's hard work. We don't avoid challenges. We don't run from adversity. We meet it head on. We evaluate it. We have a look at it. We figure it out. Hard movements. You're teaching your grandma how to snatch. That's not easy. Was it scary the first time you ever held a PVC and were told that you're going to do Olympic lifts? It was for me. I'd never. I was like, that's for like people on TV at the Olympics. I don't do that. And then they handed me a PVC. And then I went to Coach Bergner and I learned all about what that is. And suddenly, like, I can change lives with that, that PVC, and learn about Olympic lifting and then kettlebells. And there's just, it's endless. We don't shy away from that. A lot of times I hear coaches are, are um, intimidated and they don't want to teach the Olympic lifts or they don't want to teach a muscle up because they don't have one but we have to empower them to give them the tools. How do you do that? What helps a coach be empowered to teach something that's A, unfamiliar or complex to brand new people and or highly skilled people? I've taught a med ball clean to Chad Vaughn, Olympic lifter, like talk about being intimidated, really? <laughs> and he was totally cool about it. So, what do you guys do? How do you do that? How do you get them to feel okay about that hard work, to meet it head on? What do we do to help people learn? Something that's hard, something that's new. What do you guys do? Progressions, layers. I started CrossFit in 2004. I attended every seminar that there was until they told me either start teaching or don't come anymore. <laughs> Do you know what the first thing they asked me to teach was? They were like, hey, we're going to add in this new station rotation. It's called a single arm dumbbell full squat snatch. That's the first thing. Really? We just need someone to do it. Do you mind? I'm like, okay. Well, 
Coach Glassman's taught me about progressions, taught me about layering. I just gotta figure this movement out and I gotta look at how, what the pieces and the parts are and I just build those up and then hand someone a dumbbell and we'll work through each layer. And I had Coach um, Bergner with the snatch and I knew that hips come before shoulders, before elbows. And so we just put that stuff together. And if your coaches have the tools to figure out progressions and layers, they can take that complexity and simplify it. And then they can apply that throughout their life. CrossFit was built on uncompromising standards. We don't relent. We teach good form and we promote people moving at high intensity that is applicable to them as an individual. That means you have to know your athletes. You means you have to help your coaches know your athletes in each class because we need to push them in an individual way. What do they need from us today? We search for excellence in movement through 40% of the class. They're moving at low intensity under us teaching them through progressions, through layers. And we hold the line on range of motion that's pain free. You're not deep enough. Go deeper. We don't just yell go deeper. Well, we might. That might be one way. Depends on the person. But there's a million other ways to get there. You need to open your knees. You need to lift your chest and sink your hips down. You need to open your stance. Like we need to know this stuff and your coaches need to know what's the root cause for that individual to elevate their movement. And that means we need, and what else sets us apart is teaching, seeing, and correcting. Teaching, seeing, and correcting exercise, not sport. That was revolutionary. That's one of the big things that CrossFit did that many other people didn't do. The coaching of the workout, coaching of exercise, and layering in those standards, ensuring that people meet those standards. Do your athletes, or do I'm sorry, do your coaches know how to do that? If you gave them a movement that was unfamiliar, would they know what to do? Not necessarily particularly to the movement, but from a concept of breaking it down into pieces and parts to build it back up, to simplify it. Anyone? How do you guys help your coaches hold the line on the standard? Do they? What's their strength or their weakness on it? Do you guys read or get the, co the professional coach, the TPC? And just recently they put out that article about the push-up, yeah. the lowly push-up. And how like, wow, that's a, that's a lot more technical than we would have thought. There's all of those movements um, that have layers to them that can be developed. Everyone's watching. And that's also how they are stewards of your vision, of the foundation, of your mission, is how are they acting? The gold standard is that we see the CrossFit methodology, the emotional, the mental standpoint of it throughout all aspects of our life not just what we're holding others to, not just in the gym, on the gym floor, but when they're doing their workouts and hopefully their ethos as they exit the gym as well. The third thing that CrossFit is founded on from this ethos standpoint, unrivaled community spirit. What makes community? What does that mean when we say community? What does it mean to you, anyone? Together, humble, camaraderie, camaraderie. cohesion. Vulnerable. On what? What was it? Vulnerable. Vulnerable. Support. Those two go together so well. Support, vulnerability. Your workouts are hard. We just talked about it. Some days you're having a bad day. Some days you're having a good day. But the community is there for you. I had a sign up in our gym for a, a long time. It was people kept calling it their third place. We have a first place, which is typically home, a second place, which is typically work, and a third place, a place where we can kind of be ourselves with like-minded people who come together under a certain ethos 
and we, they work hard for it. It's earned, not given, to be part of a community of like-minded individuals. And so CrossFit has developed that. And it doesn't mean that other people don't have good communities, because they do, lots of them. I used to teach spinning classes before I taught CrossFit. There's an amazing community there. There's always, people are driven and they're ready to be there, frothing at the mouth, they love it. If you've ever done a Tough mutter and you've heard the guy at the beginning like give the, his speech and then you're out there with all those other people wallowing in mud, helping somebody who's not on your team, haul them up in that wall and over. And at the end, you're just like a mess and hugging people that are just like covered in mud. It's an amazing community. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but CrossFit definitely revolutionized it in the exercise world, in the gym walls itself. We're building community and we're changing the world by doing it and offering a connection, man, that we need because we have gotten so far away from it as a society. I took a year off from our gym. My husband and I took our van, we shipped it down to South America, and we spent a year down in South America driving from south to north across the entire continent. And man, you guys, <laughs> across the world, because of CrossFit, doors are open to you to find out, to, to meet people, friends and family you haven't met yet are there and waiting. They, you get to do things you would never have been able to do. You can feel safe anywhere you go. There is a home and incredible food and incredible camaraderie, community everywhere. You say that you're a CrossFitter, it's amazing if somebody hears that. If you see someone running down the street in the middle of an Ecuadorian small vil village and the way that this group is running, you're like, they do CrossFit. There's no doubt in my mind. And you f get up off of your table where you're eating dinner and you follow them until they come to a place and there's printed in handwriting, someone obviously painted it by hand, CrossFit. And you're like, these are my people. And it's everywhere. It's amazing. We went through this tiny little mountain village. We were driving this road and there was um, chain link fence around this dilapidated old um, unpainted building. There were tires, there were rusted barbells, and I was like, stop, we have to look at that back, that, go back to that place. And we looked at it and I was like, that has to be CrossFit. There's no electricity in this town. They don't have phones. How did they find out about it? It's amazing, it blows my mind. And sure enough, if you look, there's a very faded old like hand-painted sign on the side of it said CrossFit. I'm like, what is going on here? How'd they even learn about it? I love it. It's, that's your community. They're everywhere. Leadership, what does that mean to you? Can you define leadership? I can't. <laughs> I have a hard time. <laughs> what does it mean to you? Influence. Influence. Absolutely. Relationships, setting, example. setting an example, Lead by leading by example, building up, others. building up others, making other people better than you at all times, whether they work for you, whether they're your members, it's service to others. the owner of the affiliate. It is your job to protect, to build the vision and protect it, to strategize the execution of that vision. And then you have to let people know what that is and how you want them to do it. And that means you need to be present. You need to be part of your gym. You need to be on the floor, you need to be the person who cleans, you need to have been at least, the person who's under the admin, who's done the books, who's created the programming, at least at some point, you've been involved and you are there, living and breathing it. You are the example and you are handing it off to the other people. That's how you preserve it. And at the moment that we don't do that, we leave our coaches floundering 
What will they do if we're not there to lead and let them know our expectations, where the salt shaker lives, and how they can constantly move it back to the middle? How do we empower them? If we don't, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? They'll try to interpret it the best that they can. And there's no judgment on them. There shouldn't be if we didn't hand them the manual that said this is how, who we are, why we do it, and this is how I want it done. How do we ensure that? How do we lead and ensure that they can go forward as the stewards carrying forward our vision? When we give feedback, people are different. They're different. They receive information differently than you do. They process it differently than you do. So we have to be very empathetic. We need to see people as a whole person. And so we need to communicate them with them. We need to learn how best to communicate with them. Generationally, that is different. How I learned and what I expect and what I'm in a, the way I communicate, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've come on a little hot, a little hard and fast, and those that are in the younger generations haven't always received it quite that well, and it's not always gone over. And so I've had to really change how I approach that. Back in the rough and ready days of the early CrossFit days, there was, it was a lot of like, don't fuck it up. It's like, that doesn't go over now. It's like, tell me how to not. <laughs> All right, fine, I will. And so we have to communicate clearly and immediately. If you don't communicate immediately and with empathy, they think you hate them. They think you're mad at them. And that's not how we promote them becoming the stewards of our vision. Being a leader is lonely. Because you often, in holding the line, you are making people do things that you know they need to do, but they don't always want to do. Making them work hard. Making them find their intensity. Making them move through ranges of motion that aren't as easy as if they could just do a push press instead of a full squat wall ball. All of these things being a leader is lonely, but it's necessary in holding that line and ensuring that that salt shaker constantly gets pulled back to the center of the table. It also allows us to be the gatekeepers on these aspects of our foundation, ensuring we build a positive culture, ensuring that people want to keep coming in those doors and in searching for the thing that we have to offer. We can't offer everything and be good at all of it. We have to understand what it is that we're gonna offer and we have to be really, really good at it. And it's not always easy, but it is always necessary. If we can educate our athletes more and our coaches know how to educate our athletes about the stimulus of the workout more, you should be able to do 15 unbroken thrusters at this weight, and if you can't, you need to go down and wait. If they're educated, your buy-in and your pushback, your buy-in will be greater, your pushback will be less. And if you had the conversation with them when they started about the coaching and the fact that we might scale their workouts so that they can increase their work capacity across broad time and modal domains for life, if we had that conversation, we can always go back and reference it. I am here to help you grow. That is the culture. This is how we do it, because this is who we are, and this is what we do. I love that. Thank you for doing that. Anyone else do that? Teach the stimulus. You guys, this is great. Education is freeing. It's freeing. It's freeing to you. As the owner, it's freeing to your coaches who are running those classes, and it's freeing to your athletes. Do you guys ever educate about in this why? Why are we doing this workout the way it's, the stimulus is written? 
according to the, uh, what is fitness, the metabolic pathways. Do you ever talk about the metabolic pathways? That's awesome if you do, and if you don't, it's okay, but it's something to introduce. Just a little drip, drip, drip of information. I draw that graph up there, and I talk about variance on the scattering of all of the data points across short, medium, and long durations of effort, high power producing, medium, low. Today's workout is high power producing. We're doing five by one back, or 10 by one back squats. So it's gonna be up here. Tomorrow we're gonna do Fran, so it's gonna be in the middle. We're gonna do a 5K run at the end of the week. Here it is, you guys can see it. I'm trying to elevate all of your skills. It can be really helpful. Do your coaches know how to educate that? Could they do that if you ask them to? If not, that's okay. It's just something to think about. Maybe that's where they need elevation, is that depth of knowledge. Empathy meeting people where they're at, but giving them the information that they need rather than this is not a dictatorship. It, actually, it is. <laughs> this is not, I would say, it's not a democracy, but allowing them the information that they need to help accept the dictatorship. Maybe that's how you would put it. <laughs> the benevolent dictator. Yes, that's exactly it. Our last bit is coach development. And I know that a lot of you guys are searching and hopefully finding more and more help and tools for this. But this is where we bridge the gap between us being the only ones and also then helping the members understand our vision and why we're doing what we're doing, is making sure your coaches are the right people for the job. Who are they? Do you know? Because again, it's easy to go like, oh my gosh, I just love this person. They've got such a great personality. And, I, and of course, like I would love to develop somebody like that. And I have, but you can't just dump them into it. And if you want them to see the role of being a coach for your gym as, prof as a profession, if you want them to take it seriously, you need to the, both interview them and have a process of development of hire that gives them the weightiness of what that role means. Just dumping them in right after a level one doesn't do that. And I get the desperation of it. I have been there. I have done it. I need to plug holes. The ship is sinking. But I also then just realized that's not the way to do it. I'm just going to have to suck it up, and I'm going to need to be on the floor for a lot of hours for the next six months so that I can get this person up to speed. Zero to six months. Do you have a plan of development? Do you? Zero to six, maybe 24 months. What does that do? What's your plan? Half the battle is just getting like, you have this great plan, and you know, what, you know what you want to say, and then you stand up in front of all those people and they're staring at you, and you're like, blah, 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 and they just like talked way too much and way too fast, and they have a complete dissertation, and then movement starts to happen and nothing's happening. No words are coming out. And so we have to help them practice that ahead of time. What's another thing that's super important that gets missed about knowing your athletes for new coaches? And if they just get dumped in, they're not going to know any better. Names. <sighs> Say their name. Spell it right. It is their name. <laughs> it is what they are known by. Pronounce it well. Spell it well. Make it a mission. Those trainers need that to be like a week long. They only write people's names on the whiteboard for the trainers who run in the class until they learn it. And they get it right. And so that's, like, that's really important for me. What separates a lot of coaches in the gyms from, say, seminar staff level is how quickly they can see and correct and make change. And so that's really the, the development. A lot of your coaches can teach. They can say the things that are right about a movement, but to then make change on the fly and how quickly they do it on the floor. 
And so that's where I'd like to see a lot more development. I'd like to see people um, dug into a little bit more. So with these observations and with the on-ramps of your brand new coaches and being able to practice ahead of time or work with one-on-ones, maybe even one-on-five, um, maybe run some drill groups, maybe on a certain, like we're gonna learn about the GHD sit-up and I'm gonna um, teach five or six of you the GHD sit-up on Tuesday, who will join me? That can be really helpful. Dropping them into new feedback, new evaluations that they've never had to do before is gonna be tough. But if you've built that culture from the beginning, it's definitely easier. What do the, what are your coaches that are two plus and beyond um, years have been coaching for a while, what do they need more of? Coaching Getting coached. Mm-hmm, some of that, because they're, you know, it's easy to get sucked in, as we all know, to the brand new people. That includes coaches, but members, they need to get coached. They need to be held to the standard. They need to walk the talk, hopefully. But what do they need more of from a coaching development standpoint? What are you bringing it back to? You're bringing it back to the kernel, to the culture, to the ethos. This is why. And if they aren't bought in, are they the kind of person who, and that's kind of what you're looking for, are they the kind of person who wants to be developed, wants to get better, understand the hard work, the discomfort that creates growth? You have to be stretched in order to grow. That's called training. How are they going to know where they have weaknesses? You have to observe them and give them, and it takes time. You have to schedule meetings with them way ahead of time. You can't just say, hey, we should get together in a couple weeks. It takes time on your part to develop them to ensure that they're getting what they need from you. It takes every meeting you reiterating the culture of this gym is. My vision as the owner is Let's get that salt shaker back in the center of the table. This is who we are. This is why we need to do it. And this is how we do it. In this booklet you guys got today, and in the professional coach, you got it also if you got that email, is a coach's evaluation packet. And there are multiple methods of observation. There's even one where you watch one person through the entire hour, you as the observer, did they get attention? What was their demeanor? Did they come to the back of the room? Or did they ask any questions at all? Did they seem to not know? Did they ask somebody else because they didn't feel comfortable asking the coach? You get to observe a lot of that through one person. Do it again for another person. Do it again for another person. That's how they learn also how someone likes to be coached, how, what they respond best to. It takes a lot, and so this is a really helpful resource for you guys to use, especially for those two-plus-year coaches. They've been around a while. They might have some resistance, but that's what is the culture you've built, what is the culture that you want, can they be bought in? Through communication that is empathetic, asking them questions, having the six training criteria as lenses comparing it to the 10 general physical skills. We do this with athletes. Now I'm gonna do it with you because I wanna elevate you as a coach so that you meet the standard that we're looking for. You're the one everyone's looking to for guidance, for vision, so that they can build on top of that. So it gives them the instructions, the processes that they can follow. These people, they will, they will die for you. They will, they will sweat blood and tears for you. They're there for the members, but ultimately they're there for you because you believed enough in them to bring them onto your team. And now you just need to make sure that that team is all on the same page through your meetings, individual meetings, group meetings. Here are their struggles give them answers for the time that, that next they might have that situation. That's how you can develop them. That's how you can get them on board so that they want that development.
the investment that you put into your trainers professionalizes what they're doing and they will then be much more willing to invest in the time and effort that it takes for them too.